I'm rolling both cameras. Welcome to Camera Studio. It is with great pleasure that we host today on our YouTube channel Dr. Edward Harris, the man who, with the invention of the matrix, changed modern field archaeology. Welcome, Dr. Harris, and thank you for being here and accepting our invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will start with a very, very short introduction, even if there is no need for it, obviously. As we can read on the website errismetrics.com, Dr. Edward Erris is a Bermudian archaeologist who did a degree at Columbia University, New York, where he received his BA in anthropology in 1971 and took his PhD at University College London in 1979. He returned to Bermuda in 1980 and became the first director of the National Museum of Bermuda. In 1973, he created the famous Harris Matrix, the first application of which was made on the field in 1974 on the excavation of the remains of the South Gate to the Roman city of Winchester. Following the invention of the Harris Matrix in 1973, Dr. Harris was able to make the notion of stratigraphy and its application in archaeology. The subject of the doctoral thesis at University College London between 1976 and 1978. The thesis was published in late 1979 by Academic Press with the title Principles of Archaeological Stratigraphy. Since 1979, the principle of uh, archaeological stratigraphy has been translated into Italian, Spanish, French, Polish, Japanese, Slovene, German, Hungarian. Czech, Arabic, and now also in China. Now, at the website atrismeris.com, the book, except for the Italian version, is available as a free download. Okay, uh, I will start with the first question. Uh, after asking your availability for the interview, I started doing research on the web, but to be honest, I didn't find much about your bio. In this introduction to your book, the Italian archaeologist Daniele Manacorda introduced you to the reader almost as the Mr. Nobody of archaeology. Were you really? And what do you think if you reflect on the fact that you have changed archaeology? There will certainly be anecdotes about this intense period of your very young career. Do you want to share some of them with us? Well, yes, thank you very much, Stefano. Um, I have to say, I, I was born in Bermuda, uh, unusually, uh, to Anglo-American Bermudian parents, if you will. and. Uh, I first attended university in Miami uh, because of the fact that I blew myself up on the famous Guy Fawkes night, fireworks night uh, in 1963. So I was sent to a climate which was considered more equitable. And fortunately, I had a teacher there, Lydia Wyckoff was her name, who taught humanities. And she said that uh, if you liked the idea of archaeology, you could go to England and they would pay you two and six a day, about 50 cents in those days, uh, to volunteer to do archaeology. Uh, but they also gave you somewhere to live and uh, two meals a day. So I dropped out of university because this sounded interesting and uh, arrived in Winchester, England in the summer of 1967. Uh, to begin uh, what turned out to be a career in archaeology. I found that because growing up in Bermuda, particularly in those days, people were relatively uh, poor here in a way, and you learned how to do everything yourself. So when I arrived in Winchester, I was already well-schooled in how to use tools and uh, things like that, operate equipment, repair stuff, and so on. 
So um, archaeology, of course, is full of um, industrial components, if you will, machinery and various things that you have to know how to operate, including a trowel and a shovel. So uh, I, I set off. My first site that I worked on was the burial spot of St. Swithin uh, in the front of the or what was the original Anglo-Saxon cathedral, uh, later replaced by Winchester Cathedral of Song fame, the present Norman edifice at Winchester. So 1967 was a, a rare year in England. It was a beautiful summer, very little rain, and the archaeology was wonderful, as in retrospect was the highly stratified nature of the site that I worked on that summer. So I think you can say by the end of the summer of 1967, I was taken by archaeology and particularly by the business of excavating, of constructing a site in reverse uh, by stratigraphic excavation. And so for the next five summers, I came to Britain every year from university in the United States and uh, uh, continued excavating on various sites from prehistoric ones to Roman and medieval. The last site I worked on was the Bishop's Palace uh, at Winchester, uh, which was a wonderful, wonderful excavation. We started in 14th century levels and dug straight through uh, into Ro the Roman period uh, where in one of the final days in 1971, I stood on a Roman tessellated floor and had one of my diggers remove it from underneath of me. And as I said at the time, we are the Romans. We are the only people that were there. And looking back on it, what well, I suppose I meant in a sense that it was through our recording and proper excavation that we would recover the Roman site uh, underneath the Bishop's Palace at Winchester and all the other periods that we excavated through. But again, it was wonderfully stratified sites, many different layers, all sizes, colors, functions, um, absolutely wonderful stratigraphy. I only wish that in those days I had had the Harris Matrix to really make full sense of it all. After that, um, I had the opportunity to spend a year in Bergen, Norway, excavating through the winter. Very curious circumstances. The site was covered up at night and blowers were placed underneath the sort of waterproof covering to try and keep the site thawed out. But uh, as often happened when we started again in the morning, the first 10 centimeters of the site was frozen. And uh, so we chopped through blocks of stratified, frozen stratified deposits and on they went on to the spoil heap. But it was a wonderful site, absolutely full of timber remains as the town of Bergen had burned every so often and uh, uh, the fire usually stopped without destroying everything. Um, and so you dug through successive layers of the burnt out town. Compared to Britain, where if you found a piece of timber all the work stopped. This was a fantastic find. In Bergen, we were chainsawing through timbers that made up the houses, so a different type of archaeology. But what was important about going to Bergen was they had a different method of recording. And so, having been brought up in the Wheeler system in Winchester, you began to question which was the right way to do things. Um, 
Was the way they were doing in Scandinavia the correct way to record stratigraphy? Or was the Wheelerian way the correct way? So it started a process of questioning um, that would continue uh, for some years. But anyway, during this year there, David Clark, a professor from Cambridge University, famous for his models, came and gave a lecture at the University of Bergen. And it all sounded very exciting, so I applied to Cambridge University, only to receive a nice reject button. So I went back to Winchester to do some post-excavation work early in 1973. This post-excavation work basically went under the label, here's all the data that was recorded on the site, and your task is to sort it out. We now know what that means is to make the stratigraphic sequence that should have been made during the excavation the only time where it's really easiest and best to record the stratigraphic sequence now as we know in the form of a Harris matrix. So off I set. There were some 70 site notebooks, several hundred intense complicated sections and horizontal plans and your job was to phase this material as Kathleen Kenyon had begun to suggest in her book um, Beginning in Archaeology. And uh, so to phase this material, in effect, you were trying to create a stratigraphic sequence, but no one called it that at that time. So I ended up going from page to page from these notebooks. And I will have to say that there are certain log jams that had been created in the data. And one of them is, of course, was the site notebook. And that created a log jam because the notebook, by its very nature, is bound together. And in phasing, you need to be able to separate the various features, deposits, and surfaces, the one from the other, to put them into a phase. And the notebook doesn't record that exactly, unless the site was very, very simple indeed, because the rate of excavation is sometimes reflected in the notebook. Um, in some cases, you're working in one area, then you move to another, but it's in a continuous log in the notebook. And uh, so what we then engaged to do was to copy onto another sheet of paper a stratigraphic unit with its named relationships. Um, and then you had to search for the nearest neighbor, if you will, um, and assume that that uh, fitted into that particular phase, or at least was in some sort of stratigraphic order. And the problem with this is that it's verbal, it's written, and uh, be you an Einstein or otherwise, by the time you've got to page five or page six in your rewriting, you simply cannot remember the relationships that you read about five units previous or five pages previous. So I started making drawings, sort of spaghetti junction drawings, that would indicate visually somehow where we were going. And as you can imagine, these were a tremendous, as I say, spaghetti, rather than a, a, a straight forward chain of events from early to late. And I felt that if I could perhaps see these a bit more clearly, um, I would be able to sort things out. And so on the evening of 28th of February, 1973, 
I was working late with a piece of graft, half centimeter graft paper on a drawing board with a blank piece of paper on top of it um, to try and make the spaghetti junction diagrams in Scipion stratigraphic sequences more orderly so I could see where I'd been and where I was going. And uh, for some reason I started doodling on the paper, the clear paper, and started making little half centimeter rectangles with spaces uh, between them. And uh, after I had a small block of these, it just came upon me, an epiphany if you will, an artistic realization that I had something that could be used to insert the stratigraphic information. So I labored quite late into the night until I had a whole sheet of these little uh, rectangles, um, which I in jest called the Harris Matrix. Not that there was anything to do with mathematical material. It was just a matrix, something you could put information into. And on the sites I worked on in Winchester, I worked under partly under the supervision of Martin Biddle, who was then the head of the Winchester Research Unit, which had done a tremendous amount of archaeology in Winchester. He was a very good excavator, although had to spend most of his time as a manager. But he was uh, out of town for a couple of days. But when he returned, I showed him the matrix and said, I think this is something it will do such and such. And uh, I don't really know that I knew what I was talking about, but every argument his sharp brain brought up, I was able to turn aside in a way. Anyway, that was that. It then took five years to figure out in the old classic early computer phrase of garbage in, garbage out, as to what archaeologists were not doing properly in archaeological recording so that the information we put into a matrix drawing was coming out in any sort of a decent fashion. And part of this was because when the sites were recorded, it was all verbal or in drawings such as uh, sections. And in many ways, the two didn't match up because section drawings were often done much later than the excavation and the recording. And so you could never be quite certain whether the information you had in a section uh, really matched up with the information in the notebooks. So it was a, a, a major problem, the way in which things were being recorded. And it took five years to get through a number of log jams to figure out what needed to be done so that you could leave your site at the end of the excavation with a proper and complete stratigraphic sequence. Now, again, we were also locked in in retrospect to our recording methods because archaeologists are diggers. What we do is dig. And our terminology was largely based upon what you could dig. So the main features, stratigraphic features on an archaeological site were called layers. And in fact, the first Harris matrix on the bottom left-hand corner, it's called a layer chart. Because, of course, most of the stratigraphic units recorded on these sites were deposits. Now, there were occasional surfaces recorded, and these were called features. 
Um, and uh, I think the incipient understanding there was that features were called features because they disrupted the normal deck of card superposition of layers and they had to be singled out for other types of recording. And of course this is to say at the same time that individual surfaces were not recorded because of course you can't dig them. They're invisible, they're like time, they're immaterial. Surfaces do not exist unless you make a topographical plan of them. So we were stuck being diggers and we concentrated on digging the deposits. And quite often, of course, we dug through the surfaces before recording them, um, because in most cases there was no reason to record them. They weren't a tessellated floor, a mosaic floor, something that obviously um, needed recording. Um, but a surface of a layer of sand was not considered to be relevant. This all changed uh, thanks to a friend of mine, Dr. Lawrence Keane, who I met one day in Winchester, and we were discussing matters of recording, and he said, well, you really need to record every surface on an archaeological site. And this seemed to ring a bell. And so with later Dr. Patrick Ottaway, we tried an experiment on a prehistoric site on the edge of Winchester. Patrick was doing the excavating and I said to him, look, what we'd like to do here is before you excavate a deposit, you must record the surface as you understand it. And the most important thing is its boundary, how far the surface of the sand extends or whatever the layer was before you excavate it. And you could do this. We made up a pro forma sheet. Uh, so it's very easy just to record the boundary and put some spot heights on the drawing so that as we were able to do later on, you could in fact reconstruct the topography of the site uh, by having recorded these surfaces. So this was all done by hand and the extraordinary thing was the efficacy of it was proved at the end of the dig when we were able to take all of the plans and overlay them on a fixed point as it were and then sort of go like that and watch the topographical history of the site build up through time. And this brought home that one of the major tasks of the excavating archaeologist after the dig is over should be to reconstruct the topography of the site. And I would venture to say that unfortunately even today there are many sites where surfaces are not fully recorded and you cannot reconstruct the topography of the site. This is a major disaster for history and an embarrassment for archaeology in my view. But to come back to uh, the development of the matrix, or more correctly, the development of principles of archaeological stratigraphy. So uh, after we excavated, Martin Biddle and I did it, we excavated the South Gate site. I made a stratigraphic sequence for it almost immediately upon the end of the excavation. Uh, that was eventually published, but again that was significantly under-recorded uh, because we had yet to fully recognize that we had to record every surface of every layer or deposit and of course those surfaces such as ditches which have no deposits but result 
in the destruction of pre-existing surfaces and deposits. So the Southgate site is probably under-recorded by about um, 40% or whatever it is. And indeed, most of the excavations of that period, you could say, were probably under-recorded anywhere up to 51%, because, of course, there are always more surfaces on any archaeological site than there are deposits. Because you always end up, at the end of the day, with a surface that you don't excavate, excavate be it geological or whatever it is. So you're always going to have more surfaces than deposits. So I tried to garner more interest in this, uh, in Winchester, in doing another experiment, but uh, there were no bigger digs going on at the time. So I approached Brian Hobley and uh, the archaeologist at the Museum of London. And we had a seminar, and uh, I said, now what I would like you to do uh, on the great GPO site, General Post Office site opposite St. Paul's Cathedral, I would like you to experiment with the recording system, which I'm now going to lay out for you. And the most important thing is that every surface should be individually recorded, it should be on a separate piece of paper. Every surface and every deposit should have its own, what they eventually called single context, its own sheet of paper, separate from everything else, so that at the end of the day you could shuffle these, um, which you can do so easily now on a computer. You could shuffle these into the phases in which they belong. Because, of course, the rate of excavation or the chronology of excavation is not going to be the same at the end of the day as the stratigraphic chronology of the site. And so at the end of the dig, you have to turn things back and work from the earliest to the latest. So they kindly did this experiment for three months and we had another seminar at which it was agreed that everything we had predicted for the method proved to be so. It made the digging process more efficacious, faster, um, and more stratigraphic. And so this was adopted in London and eventually adopted in other places. As I noted, the main fly in the ointment was the question of surfaces. And uh, that was eventually uh, fully resolved. And from there, I moved to uh, do a PhD uh, at London University because I intended to go to the United States to work or Canada. And I'd already had difficulty going to Canada because while I had all the prerequisite skills, when you get to the civil servant level, all they were looking for was your PhD degree. If you didn't have that degree, forget it. Anyway, I, I went up to, um, thanks again to Lawrence Keane, I enrolled at University College London under then, uh, eventually, Sir David Wilson and James Graham Campbell, who weren't at the Institute of Archaeology, but across the road at University College in the Department of Scandinavian Studies, which was kind of ironic given my time that I'd spent in Bergen. And I was to do my uh, thesis on one of the large excavations at Winchester. This proved not to be the case as the president of the university received a letter refusing permission for me to use that material. So I was brought into the principal's office, if you will. Well, what are you going to do, Harris? And I said, well, let me do my thesis on the matrix and archaeological stratigraphy. It's never been done before. 
and uh, I've already published a few things on the subject, so I think it would be good to spend a couple of years of research into the whole matter. Oh, no, 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 you, you can't do that. That's theoretical, it's dangerous, dangerous. You've got to have some coins and some pottery and some things. Well, thanks to both of them, they kind of allowed me to do my thesis on um, what eventually became Principles of Archaeological Stratigraphy. And after I completed my PhD, one of my advisors, Professor Dimbleby, said you should go to Academic Press and perhaps redo your thesis as a small textbook. We publish textbooks and so on. And um, in the way of things, I didn't think he was that serious. And oddly enough, I stayed in London. <coughs> and one day I ran into him on the street. And he said, why haven't you gone to Academic Press? Oh, oh, oh. Anyway, the upshot was that I rewrote the thesis and Academic Press produced the book in six months and Principles of Archaeological Stratigraphy uh, was published. At the same time, I was suing another archaeologist in the High Court of Chancery in London for stopping me from publishing my first archaeological excavation that I did by myself. So, as a result, I decided to come home to Bermuda for a while and to go back to Australia where I'd had a wonderful year in 1977. When I was there, I gave a lecture on the Matrix and as happened in several other places, literally fights broke out in the lecture hall between the old timers, if you will, all the old time thinkers and people who agreed that this was the new way. And I have to say, um, before I returned to Bermuda, I spent nearly five years traveling all over Britain, talking to anybody who would listen to tell them the new way, the true way had arrived. So um, it was an interesting time. Uh, I met a number of wonderful archaeologists, many positive reactions, and uh, then Principles of Archaeological Stratigraphy came out, and the rest, as they say, is history or archaeology. Yes, it's history. You're right. Thank you for these words. It's quite interesting to understand how it was uh, a very hard work a very, a very hard job to to reach the goal at the end but so you were not a mr nobody archaeologist you, you are you you were really an archaeologist when you started to write your phd well i think one has to understand some of the cultural dynamics in a way um i came from bermuda a very small island of 50,000 people in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the second most remotest place on Earth after Tristan de Kuna or Easter Island or somewhere like that. And uh, when I went out into the wider world, going to university or going to England to excavate, I often saw myself in the terminology of the time as a Sputnik, a satellite, circling the society I was in, looking in from the outside, from Bermuda, if you will, on what was happening in front of me. I think the fact that I was a nobody, that I was an outsider, made it possible, looking back on it, to uh, perhaps have come up with the matrix and various things in relationship to that. Uh, for example, the court case uh, that I took to the High Court of Chancery, um, I was able to do because I was an outsider. 
A similar situation had happened with a British archaeologist, and as far as I know, her paper, uh, which was threatened, if you will, uh, was never published. Um, so I was able to do things because I wasn't really connected, if you will. And I have to say that you don't know how these things pan out. But one of the books I read uh, before The Matrix was a small paperback called The Double Helix. And this was by Watson and Crick, the inventors of the founding of the shape of DNA. And this ties in with archaeology, which I'll explain in a minute. But anyway, there were several people working on the problem at the time. Um, the, uh, the question of what did DNA look like? And there were Watson and Crick, and there was also uh, a lady, uh, I think she was at University College, who was also working on the matter. And ultimately, Watson and Crick beat her out by a few months, and they got the prize. But they spent most of their time having a good time in Copenhagen and London, as far as one could read, and they were playing with models. And their discovery, while important, is not in, as important, in my view, as the invention by Linus Pauling of the three-dimensional chemical model for an atom or whatever it's for. So uh, Linus Pauling uh, gave a lecture one day and then he pulled the cape off and there was this model showing chemical compound or atom, whatever it was, instead of being a one-dimensional solar system look, was a three-dimensional model and that changed chemistry forever. In my view, the matrix mirrors that, except that we have a four-dimensional model because within and between and throughout, our model is time. And that is its value to archaeology. So I read this book and, and thought, um, well, that's the way to do it. I'm a lazy person by nature. Um, I, I should be able to party in London and where else. And and invent something uh, to become famous for, I guess, or whatever. Anyway, who knows how these things affect you or, or whatever, but in some ways I, I think that lurking in the background was Linus Pauling's three-dimensional model, the model of what eventually you see of the, the DNA, that lies in the background in terms of the creation of the matrix and true stratigraphic sequences for archaeological sites. And in a flight of fancy, you can take the analogy a bit further. And you can say that every archaeological site has a unique DNA model. And that is its value to history. Everyone every site, everywhere, has a unique stratigraphic sequence, its own, very own DNA framework, which illustrates the life of people on that site over hundreds of thousands of years. And so the, the metaphor, the simile uh, between the revolution in chemistry and the revolution archaeology uh, have a similar sort of looks in a way. So to answer the question that I was a Mr. Nobody, it's true in a way. Um, I, I didn't come from Britain. I wasn't embedded in the British archaeological structure. And, uh, but that probably gave me the leeway to do what I did. Of course, had I stayed in Britain, um, I would have become embedded in the uh, British archaeological system and um, might have risen to the top of the heap there or whatever, and might have become Mr. Somebody. 
but I decided to return home to Bermuda. I had no intentions of staying here. I was going to go back to Australia and I made the decision to become the first director of what became the National Museum of Bermuda, which I ran for 37 years. My greatest regret is that I stopped excavating and eventually became an onlooker encouraging and make it possible for other archaeologists to do underwater archaeology and land archaeology at Bermuda, where, like anywhere where people have settled, there's a great deal of archaeological remains, which, of course, is the only true aspects of history that you can rely on, especially if they're excavated stratigraphically and true. So, yes, I was not connected, and uh, it's, it's kind of interesting in a way um, that, as a Mr. Nobody, not one learned archaeological society anywhere in the world has given me an award for what I seem to have created, which is the revolution in archaeology in terms of excavation and recording, which is our basic function as excavating archaeologists. So that's how it went. Um, I, don't, I don't regret any of it. Um, and uh, being at home in Bermuda uh, did allow me to continue um, with, at a distance, stratigraphic work to assist people to make publications of the book. I eventually bought out the publishers because they wouldn't do a paperback. Uh, they did a second edition, but it was always very expensive. So we bought them out. And with my friends from the University of Vienna, Dr. Wolfgang Neubauer and Klaus Locker, we set up the Harris Matrix website in 2003. And I think now there are 10 translations plus English of the book and the later practices of archaeological stratigraphy available for free, free downloading. And uh, so it's gratifying when you get a very nice comment uh, on the website saying like, this is the Bible for archaeology. Every archaeologist have one under their pillow and so on and so on. So um, I remain in the shadows, but that's okay. That's, it's not important. I'm not important. What's important is that our archaeological work should be done properly and competently. And unfortunately, there are still no professional mechanisms, except in one or two places, to require that sites are excavated and recorded by the stratigraphic method. And to bolster that, I recently had an email conversation with someone in classical archaeology, uh, that is to say the archaeology of Greece and Rome, perhaps, who was of the view uh, that people are still excavating in some places, excavating sites uh, like they used to do in the 1950s, including following the walls by destroying all adjacent stratification without proper record, and so on. So ultimately, I think the profession has to face this matter, which eventually is going to end up in a court of law, particularly when it comes to sites excavated to reveal acts of genocide and what have you, which is where some of these cases are going to go into courts of law. And I believe that we can demonstrably show that the correct way to excavate these sites is not by arbitrary methods, but by the stratigraphic method. And anybody else who's doing it by arbitrary methods should lose their case in court. But within our own profession, we need professional guidelines. I would point out, for example, one learned society in the United States has dozens of pages of dealing with 
native peoples and their archaeology and not one paragraph about how archaeologists should conduct themselves on archaeological digs. So just to round out again, um, I suppose I am a Mr. Nobody, but that's okay. I have some good friends. I've met wonderful archaeologists all over the world. Um, in recent years, I've been invited to talk um, in various places. And uh, I have to say the strongest support um, I've had over the years uh, really comes from Italy and Spain and Mexico uh, to, to a degree. That's not to say a lot of other people haven't helped and done things all over the world, but I have to say, uh, as Italians, you were one of the first uh, overseas, that is to say outside of Britain, to adopt the method and to test it. Um, and your edition of Principles is still in print, I believe. It's probably the longest running edition worldwide uh, still in print. So there we are. Mr. Nobody <laughs> gives you his view. So next year we celebrate the 50 years since the creation of the Matrix. You know? And the criticism of the Matrix have historically always belonged to two different strands. That of geologists for issues related for the formation of the strata, and that of the medieval archaeologists, most of the Italians, for the application of uh, the metrics to the wall structures. But for the rest, a stratigraphic anonymism seems to prevail between the scholars, which is suspect, do you think? Uh, for some, the metrics is a, a brilliant and unsurpassable. For others, it's too simple that it suits us because everyone knows how to do it. After so many years, the question is, why the matrix has always remained in use practically without ever being modified? Well, I come back to uh, the question of ethics, if you will, in our profession. And it's always been my contention that if you are a good stratigrapher, as an archaeologist, you don't even have to excavate, but you can still be a good stratigrapher. You can understand what it's all about. You can read stratigraphic sequences. And as with a financial auditor, a good stratigraphic archaeologist should be able to go anywhere in the world, look at any site records or excavations, and within five minutes say, you're doing it right, or your books are in complete disarray, um, and we can't give you a qualified, we have to give you a qualified statement on your financial statements, if you will. Um, this is because stratigraphy, stratification, and stratigraphy is everywhere the same in terms of units of stratification. The con cultural context is secondary. Of course, it's very important. It's obviously important. It's the DNA, the cloth going on to the DNA skeleton. But stratigraphy and stratification is everywhere the same. There are two components, or three if you will, two types of surfaces and deposits. And of course, there are different types of deposits. A wall is different than a layer of concrete or whatever. But everywhere, stratification is the same. And stratigraphic principles also apply to other things that you do. If you're a motorcycle enthusiast, or you like taking apart your lawnmower, you have to take it apart in reverse stratigraphic order and you have to put it back in stratigraphic order or it's not going to work. So when the matrix began to be seen in the public eye, there were people who objected to it. 
Uh, some of them were geo-archaeologists, and some of them, some of the most vociferous, were actually archaeologists. Uh, I was never published in the United States, and the one paper I did send in one time had a comment on the bottom. I've kept it, and basically it was like, this person should be run out of Dodge. Put him on his horse, get him out of his profession. He can't do this. And I was talking about surfaces and the importance of surfaces. The problem has, in my view, very much dissolved. Uh, the geoarchaeologists have appreciated that their objections were talking to one aspect of stratification, to a large degree, the innards of deposits, uh, where I was talking to the totality of stratification and stratigraphy and the creation of stratigraphic sequences. I will say that one day geologists in soft rock geology will use the Harris matrix because it's already a proven system to show stratigraphic sequences. It doesn't matter whether it's natural deposits or made by people or whatever. It's, it's stratification. You could even use it in very hard rock. But geologists, to a degree, um, are still stuck in the mode that we were in before the matrix. That is to say, the section is supreme. The section is the way that you show the stratigraphic sequence. And so even now, the geologist will show you a, a cut through the earth, uh, and basically they will say that's a stratigraphic sequence. Well, uh, for that particular section, it may be, unless, of course, there's a surface in there which is the result of erosion, which in fact will then change the nature of the stratigraphic sequence in the end. So they're still stuck in what I consider to be the visual period of understanding stratification as opposed to the four-dimensional model of the um, stratigraphic sequence, the matrix. Now, I say that as far as I can see, most objections have um, dissipated. And the issue with the matrix, if you will, and not so much an issue, is that I thought from the time of its invention that the matrix was a true system. By that I mean that if you put the information into the system and it doesn't come out properly, it's not the system that's wrong, it's your information that's wrong, that you've recorded incorrectly. And because from its inception uh, it was a true system, so it has prevailed. Now, it has not been further developed, although some people try and simplify things and so on and so on, but the basics will always be the same. Now, you can expand the look of it. So, for example, you could have different symbols for different types of surfaces or deposits. So, for example, uh, surfaces of deposits uh, could be uh, just a round circle. Surfaces that destroy pre-existing could be triangles. Um, deposits could be rectangles. Um, and you can color them, you can do all sorts of things, particularly now on the computer, to make them more visually readable. But the basics remain the same. Things have to be in stratigraphic order, with the earliest at the bottom and the latest at the top. And uh, in the structure of Scientific Revolution, which is an old book now, but one of the tenets that the authors made for that book was that sometimes it takes the removal of previous generations for new methods to be accepted. And I regret to say that it seems to some degree that is what has happened in archaeology. So it's taken a long time uh, for the revolution uh, to uh, take place. Now, again, this ties into the cultural nature within archaeology, wherein in earlier times, the director was the supreme individual. 
It was the director who decided this, who decided that, who would look at a tray of pottery and decided what the date of the deposit was, and so on and so on. Um, whereas in true stratigraphic working, the most important person is the person doing the excavating and doing the discovery and doing the recording. And some people object to the what they would consider to be the rote nature of recording using the matrix system. But that is certainly better than the unprincipled and undefined nature of recording that existed previously, where directors often made up their own system in the absence of a universal system, and of course left you behind with things that you had to then bring in a hieroglyphic expert to decipher and decide what on earth was happening on that archaeological site. So because stratigraphy is everywhere the same, the methods of recording it are of universal application and can be done without regard to the cultural context and can be done without the regard to the cultural content of, of, a, of a site. Uh, you could, I could go anywhere in the world and competently excavate a site without knowing anything about the pottery that's coming up in the deposits or the coins or whatever. Um, I could competently do my job. So while people object to this because they think it's sort of rote, but in a way that's part of our job. And what it has done is made the uh, business of recording more efficient, very efficient, very fast, leaving you all the time that was wasted previously trying to sort out, to make a stratigraphic sequence after the fact, usually impossible, to spend that time then doing the cultural research and the interpretation of the stratification, the reconstruction of the landscape, and of course the study of the contained remains, be it the house, a wall, or, or, or artifacts coming out of deposits. And I'll have to say that, again, this comes back to this fundamental question, or this fundamental tenet, that one of our important roles is to reconstruct the topography. Now, if you look at books on landscape archaeology, there's very little in them about the fact that landscape archaeology begins on an archaeological dig. And once you've finished digging, you should be able to reconstruct the landscape, <coughs> <coughs> reconstruct the landscape of that site by employing the records of every surface that you've recorded, all the surfaces you've recorded, because you will always record all of them. So they deal with the mega aspects of landscape archaeology. What I'm saying is that it is absolutely vital that we be able, and we can do it so easily now with PCs and Macs, more important, and PCs, um, because with GIS programs, there is absolutely no excuse whatsoever and giving laser scanning to be able to record every surface before you excavate the deposits underneath of the surface and then to be able to recreate the landscape surface by surface. So if you've got a thousand surfaces on an archaeological site, you've got a thousand periods, if you will, generally speaking. So this is the important role that we have to do, which is to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again if you haven't recorded his surface, his body outline, his important feature, the, not, the immaterial aspects of the site, which is the surfaces, are the surfaces. So while there are objections, I think part of the problem came because the geoarchaeologists and archaeologists uh, thought I was attacking the major tenants that have to do with the interpretation of the contained remains. And I was not doing that at all. Uh, and in fact, I, I often say I'm not interested in artifacts per se. 
that's not me. There are other people who do that wonderfully. There are also people who shouldn't do that wonderfully but shouldn't be allowed to dig on a site because they're not good excavators. My interest has been on the fundamentals of archaeological sites, which are it's the interpretation and proper record of its stratification and making a stratigraphic sequence, which is the primary role of an excavating archaeologist before they leave the site. So looking back on it, uh, in my view, the controversy in certain areas where it was has dissipated. Uh, I think if people understand that, you know, a lot of diggers, for example, love being diggers. Uh, they don't want to be the person who's going to write the academic report or do the full research on the site. They like excavating, uh, as I did. They, they like the digging. It's a wonderful business. And if you do it rec recorded properly, you then hand this archive to any other archaeological types of person or geologist or whomever wants to look at the data of your site, you have recorded it truly, you've excavated stratigraphy, you've recorded it stratigraphically, and you are handing them a, a package that is incontroversial. As Sir Charles Lyell said, and I often like to quote him, he basically said, look, the remains of the past in a stratigraphic context are without bias. No one goes out to create stratification. No one. Mother Nature doesn't go out to create stratification. It's a byproduct of living. And because of that, it has no political connections. It has no biases whatsoever. And as Sir Charles Lyell said, if you record it properly, then you will have recovered the monuments of the past in that particular site or in that geological context. And you can be sure that because it's unbiased that the information is true. And you can hand that unbiased stratigraphic record to any other archaeologist or anyone else interested in further interpretation uh, of the site in all its aspects. For example, if you're having some carbon-14 dates done of an archaeological site, you should hand the stratigraphic sequence to the lab people doing those dates and say these, these are the places, deposits in which we found these things. Here they are on the order and this is what should be reflected in your chronology. If it's not, it's not that the stratification is wrong, is that the object has become displaced or whatever, and you have to find the reason for that. You cannot overthrow the unbiased record of the stratigraphic sequence. So yes, there were a lot of objections um, and uh, uh, very enjoyable to get them in a way. Uh, sometimes I perhaps answer them too stridently, but um, um, for example, there was one case where there was a young archaeologist, I guess, who uh, stumbled upon what we now call the, I don't know, I'm getting older, so I forgot it. Anyway, permutation of stratigraphic sequences. This is a whole area which I'm not sure how much is being done because I, you know, I don't have my ear to the ground being in Bermuda and so on that one would like to have. Um, but there are people like Dr. David Bibby in, in Germany who have written about this. Um, but basically it's a whole new area, not new, but it's a whole area where um, the stratigraphic sequence can permutate, but only not to change any relationships, but it can be stretched or contracted depending upon the artifact content. Um, and um, 
it's a, it's a big issue. But now, of course, we have computers that can juggle information for us at high speed um, and so on. But at the end of the day, you've had your, you've made your stratigraphic sequence. You've looked at the artifacts contained in it for some absolute dates uh, so that, you know, the things in the Roman period sink to the bottom and the medieval are at the top or whatever. Um, and once you've done that, you can then rearrange the surfaces of the site or bring them into phase periods and then they can be made into composite plans for a phase or a period. And I suppose that's an aspect we ought to mention as well now. Just to harken back, when we were doing recording at Winchester, uh, the only surfaces that we would record were what I call composite plans. And at some point the director decided that a surface that you'd excavated too should be recorded. Um, and while well, it wasn't said in those days because we didn't know what we were talking about, but the assumption was that if you recorded that surface, that surface was a true period or phase surface at the time rather than an accident of excavation um, and, and uh, should be recorded. Of course, it took a long time to do this. Excavation stopped for a week or whatever, depending on the size of the site, while these huge plans were made. Well, composite plans are just as bad as notebooks. They put things together that you cannot take apart, particularly in the case of plans, because if you try and take it apart, there's going to be a data gap underneath of the thing that you take off, uh, because you didn't record any surfaces underneath of it. So these composite plans are, 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 are deadly in a way because they should be made after the fact. Now, of course, if you come across something like a Roman mosaic floor, you obviously record that to the nth degree with photography and drawings and whatever else. Um, but um, that's, that's a different kettle of fish. For most surfaces, you need to record its topography and that's it. So... Um, I think the controversy has largely died down, although there are many people who still insist that it's more scientific to excavate an arbitrary spits. But of course, the problem with that is that you destroy surfaces before you can record them, and uh, your stratigraphic sequence becomes an arbitrary deck of card shape and it loses all the variabilities that you will have on most archaeological sites, which is where, of course, the permutations come in because a development inside a building is different from development outside of the building, and eventually with your phasing, you have to bring them into some sort of accord. And this is where, even if you look at my drawings and my books, to a degree, um, the logic of phasing was not carried through fully because what you should see is periods of deposition, say all with rectangles for deposits, and then periods of circles and triangles which represent surfaces on which people lived, by the way, and, and uh, that represents the topography of the site at that period. So you're always going to get, when you look at the period, you're going to get periods of disuse when things are buried, if you will, on the concrete floor that I'm sitting on at the moment has been put into disuse so I could walk on it. Um, and uh, the surface of that survives for many years more than the deposit, which took a day or two to lay down the concrete. So this is a a fascinating thing and of course it harks back to the origins of geology with James Hutton in Scotland who pointed out to everyone's amazement or chagrin that the surfaces all nearly always occupy more time than deposits and this became a fundamental 
of geology and eventually led to his principles of uniformitarianism. But the point is that he acknowledged that surfaces were not only real things, although immaterial, but they occupied far more time than do deposits. So ultimately, your stratigraphic sequences should have sort of large gaps in them, if you will, between the deposits and the periods in absolute time when the surface was in use. And as you well know, in Italy, you have surfaces that are now part of the modern day and the surface has been in use for thousands of years. But in effect, it hasn't. If you recorded it today, you're recording the latest version of that surface, which comes down, hits the sidewalk, and then you have a surface of the sidewalk and on you go. So I think the controversy has dissipated. These, uh, the matrix remains still going strong after 50 years. And as I say, French, Arabic and Chinese have, in the last two years have joined the translations because originally the system was true and there's no need to make it truer. You can elaborate it with symbols and things to make it easier. So, uh, for example, you could have a symbol that represented postals. So whenever you looked at a thing, you could say, that's postal, or that's a grave, and so on. And you say, well, graveyard. Uh, so and that doesn't interfere with the stratigraphic sequence. That just allows some coding to make things easier to read. The other thing, of course, that one should mention uh, that came out of the experiment in London was the archaeologist said it was wonderful because we built the stratigraphic sequence diagram in reverse on the site hut wall. I have to make some corrections a bit later when we were digging further down. But when you had a new person come to the site, you could take them in and say, here, we started up here. We went down through these layers here in the 13th century, and now you're down here digging on Roman deposits. That's where you are. And you have to go out and add the deposits and the surfaces underneath of that. So as a instrument for showing people what happened on the site, it became invaluable as well. So I think the controversy is, is over. Um, the only problem we face now is that we need to have our professional learning societies begin to insist that if you're an excavating archaeologist, you have to pass some tests to show you know how to excavate stratigraphically and make a matrix. And this doesn't obviate making some section drawings if you like, but so on. But you absolutely have to record every surface. And of course, as you well know now, with GIS, you can make cross sections across the site anywhere you want if you've recorded the surfaces. So it's not that we're getting rid of stuff. We're simply saying you must concentrate on what's important. And the most vital thing is to record the surfaces. The surfaces are absolutely the key to understanding and creating the stratigraphic sequence. So to those no-sayers, well, let's have an argument when you're on a dig and we'll see how it goes. I have two other questions, uh, in part related with the, your last uh, consideration. The first is that probably uh, there's the idea that the realization of the metrics is a mainly technical operation, you know, which everyone can do. So, uh, in relation to this view, for some people, some scholars, as a side effect of the matrix, so its simplicity in learning, may have transformed it into a tool to train at no cost, low cost labor to manage excavation. What's your opinion in, in this matter? And the other question is related to, I was thinking about uh, the figure that uh, Andrea Carandini defined the typologist of human and natural actions in the soil. So this kind of uh, figure, 
these archaeology archaeologists can have or must have skills in different ways so cultural historical theoretical but of course these archaeologists cannot fail to have the specific skills in stratigraphic medium and metrics so i would say that the creation of this profile i think it's uh, or should be the main goal of the university. What's, what's your opinion about this? Do you think that the universities and, uh, are doing this today, this kind of path for students? So do you have any advice for young students of archaeology in this sense? I would say to a young student of archaeology, or indeed anyone. If you can learn to think stratigraphically, it will change your outlook on a lot of the world. The world that we live in is full of stratigraphic entities, not just the things that archaeologists dig up, but the whole business of creating things. For example, you can't put the roof on the house until you've constructed the walls. So that's a stratigraphic process. If you can think stratigraphically, it'll change the way you look at the world. I sometimes find if I'm walking in an urban context, if I see a window being replaced in my mind's eye like a cartoon, I see that window popping out and going to its right position in the stratigraphic sequence. I see the world as put together in the right order. And if we didn't put things together in the right order, a lot of things would fall down. Now, in terms of being considered just a technical thing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with technical things. And in fact, we should be teaching anyone who wants to dig to be a stratigraphic technician. And I would suggest we stop telling them they should be all things to all people. I think we've fallen into a trap in recent generations to thinking that each archaeologist should be this polymath, that we should all know what this and that and this and that and, blah, 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 and uh, whatever. Um, that's all well and good. There's no problem with that. But when you're in the ground facing stratigraphic entities, you have to be a technician. You have to know what you are doing. You have to be able to read the ground. You have to be able to decide when you've finished uh, excavating a deposit and there's new ones underneath of it, which is the latest, where is its surface? content. What the matrix did was to make this easy. And there's nothing wrong with things being easy. And not only did it make it easy, but it made the post excavation work easy. Whereas after, afterwards, in the old days, post excavation work was a disaster. As one chap wrote, he wrote a paper called Sites without principles. In other words, sites that have been excavated before principles of archaeological stratigraphy appeared in 1979. Many of these sites you cannot decipher because there was no technical attention to the stratigraphy. They were after the artifacts or whatever their emphasis was. And uh, so, in my view, the university should be teaching students about stratigraphy whether or not they excavate, because if they don't know about stratigraphy and stratigraphic sequences, how can you analyze a body of pottery that you've been given from an archeological site? You have to be able to test that against the only testing pattern you have, which is the stratigraphic sequence. It is the testing pattern for all later analysis, and it's compiled technically. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, what people are insipidly, not, not insipidly, wrong word, sorry, suggesting is that the excavating archaeologist should be this culturally mindful 
person um, and, and uh, that, you know, they should know all the nuances of Roman pottery or, or, or whatever. Uh, they should, should know all of this and all of that. Uh, I don't agree with that. We cannot be all things to all people. But in the first instance, whether you dig or not, you should understand stratification, principles of stratigraphy, the laws of stratigraphy, what is a stratigraphic sequence, what is a surface, what is landscape on an archaeological site, even if you don't excavate, because you cannot analyze the contained remains, whatever they may be, without reference to the testing pattern to the stratigraphic sequence. So what the matrix has done has made it easy to teach people. You, you know, you have volunteer coming onto the site, you can teach them in 10 minutes, look, this is what you have to do. And then you must do this, this is absolutely essential. And I'm showing you why, because when you finish your first surface plan, bring it into the site hut and we're gonna put it underneath the ones that have been recorded before you. So you can begin to see the development of the site. And while some people think it's a technical thing, the fact of the matter is that if you excavate stratigraphically, you record stratigraphically, you work with the matrix thing, it will enliven the excavation. <coughs> it will cause the technicians to think, and they will add that thinking to their records. <coughs> So, one of the great strengths of archaeology used to be, certainly in Britain, that volunteers would come and work on archaeological digs. And I think this was vitally important. It's a way of connecting people, literally connecting them with history. If you're a young person and you find a Roman coin while you're digging, make your day, make your year, whatever. Um, and the matrix, you can do a tutorial on the matrix and what you have to do properly in five or ten minutes. So as far as I'm concerned, rather than being an impediment to the interpretation of the site or any post-excavation analysis or interpretation, the matrix and its method is fundamental to recording the site properly and giving all other archaeologists and technicians of whatever type the, the fundamental unbiased data that they need to do their interpretation. So I'm not interested in Roman pottery. Let the person who loves it do it. But I will give them the data which they cannot contravene and we can discuss what their problems might be. And by overlaying surfaces, for example, you can often demonstrate where there might have been some infiltration of things because if you piece plot as well, you know, they've turned up in this particular area. So far from being just a technical thing, uh, it is essential that the work of excavation be technically and competently technically done. So that would be my answer to them. And I think the stratigraphic recording and use of principles of archaeological stratigraphy has opened up a whole new world to archaeology in general. And we should be thankful for those people who like to be technicians, who like to dig rain, sleet or snow, and who enjoy building the stratigraphic sequence and understanding how the site built up and presenting you with not only the stratigraphic sequence, but using the surface plans, presenting you with a period for every surface or whatever you like. But not only that, we're just giving you a file and saying, if you go through this, you can watch, you can watch the buildup of the topography and you can hook that into the deposits where the artifacts came from. By the way, yeah, because of my experience, I completely agree with you. Oh, <laughs> but you know, as a friend of mine, we we grew up with these, as you probably did. You press the bottom, falls over. 
I say this is the easiest way to demonstrate what it's all about. This is stratification and when you let it go that's your stratigraphic sequence. So while these medieval layers might have touched some Romans one here, when you make it into the stratigraphic sequence it's unique for that site and is the testing pattern for all later work. So I think one get, get, getting a sign now from people who download the book that universities are teaching this and as a friend of mine said to me many years ago but I didn't do anything about it if you want to make a change follow the money and what he meant by that was of course as has happened I believe in Belgium or the Netherlands the funding authority of government makes it a requisition that you record the site by stratigraphic methods and you, you come out of it with a stratigraphic sequence otherwise you're not going to get your grant. So we need in my view more competent technicians particularly in those areas or subjects of archaeology where they think they're different because of their cultural context and because of their cultural context they can ignore the fundamentals of stratification and stratigraphy. We need more people who are technically competent in their field, that is to say as excavating archaeologists. You know, your point of view remains, still remains quite revolutionary still today <laughs> because of this. Anyway, um, thank you. Thank you very much. And I have the last question. Um, are you planning something for the fifth anniversary of the Matrix? Um, I've had a few discussions with my good friends in Vienna and um, I understand there may be a possibility of having a conference in Italy next year, which I think would be wonderful. Um, my friends wanted to have something in Bermuda, but Bermuda is a difficult place to get to. And, and uh, so uh, we might work on this idea with you and your colleagues and my colleagues from Vienna. But I think it'll be a, a fun thing to do. It will be, be a pleasure also for us to have you in Florence, you know. Well, that's very, very kind of you indeed. Um, I have to say, I, I think I've been very lucky um, as um, the Wikipedia site, which I keep saying I must go in and revise. I didn't do it to begin with. And there's a picture of me, the worst for the wear in Warsaw, I believe it was, where I perhaps had a bit too much vodka. But that needs to be replaced with something respectable. But um, uh, that's one of the things I would like to do sometime soon is to uh, simplify the Wikipedia page um, and uh, perhaps for the 50th anniversary next year. But the profession, uh, generally speaking, has been very kind to me because, of course, the Harris Matrix as a name doesn't mean anything. Its real name is the stratigraphic sequence. That's what the diagrams are. They're four-dimensional stratigraphic sequences representing the stratification after it's been excavated and stretched and allowed to float into its correct chronological position in relative time as if each stratigraphic unit was connected with a string and they're all balloons and when you took the lid off the archaeological site everything rises up on its separate stands to show the stratigraphic sequence of the site. So I've been lucky in a way that everyone calls them Harris matrices, but uh, I called it that in, in jest. Uh, but the name is stuck, which has been very kind of people. And uh, I have to say that I do commend all those archaeologists who continue to work with tremendous passion and fever despite difficult circumstances, 
wherever they are in the world, uh, to recover the human past. It's an important job that we do. A friend of mine, now deceased in Australia, who was buried in his digging outfit with his trowel, felt that archaeology uh, as an image, or society as an image, was a great bulldozer, and that archaeology was the sharp edge of the blade in the front of the machine. And it is right, we have a very important function to do. We only have a chance to do it once. And if our recording, as Sir Charles Lyle said, is correct, it will be an unbiased record of the past at that particular site. And the stratigraphic sequence will mirror that unbiased records, as will the topographical plans allowing the site to be interpreted, reinterpreted, reinterpreted uh, forevermore to the gratification of having people to know about the past. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope to see you next year in Europe. I don't know where, but anyway. And also uh, I hope that in the future we will still have the opportunity to do some other interview on this channel. If you have time, it will be a pleasure for us to host you again here. So I thank you very much. It was really a pleasure for me to have uh, this interview with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, thank, thank you, and I hope we can do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. If you want to discover more about archaeology and our ancient past from a different perspective, make sure to click on the Camnus logo here below. And don't forget to turn on the notification bell so you will never miss an episode and join the archaeological community in search of the truth.